Can I welcome everybody to the third meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2016, and I can remind everybody to ensure that all electronic devices are switched off. Our first item is to decide whether to consider our work programme in private at our next meeting. Are members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you very much. Our next item is to take evidence on two pieces of subordinate legislation as listed on the agenda. Can I welcome to the committee Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, and our accompanying officials. Um, after we have taken evidence on the instruments, we will debate the motions in the name of the Cabinet Secretary at items 3 and 4. Officials, of course, are not permitted to contribute to the formal debates. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make some opening remarks on both instruments? Cabinet Secretary. Okay, thank you, Convener. I am grateful to Committee for uh, allowing me to come along to this morning's meeting to uh, contribute to your discussions about the, the Draft Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974 Exclusions and Exceptions Scotland Amendment Order 2016 and the Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 Remedial Order No. 2, Order uh, 2015. I would like to thank Parliament, this committee, officials and business managers for the support and timetable in Parliament's consideration uh, of these orders. Members will recall that the Government and Parliament reformed Scotland's state disclosure and self-disclosure regime on the 10th of September last year. The procedure for the remedial order that took forward the state disclosure aspects of the reforms required that stakeholders be given an opportunity to make written observations on it. We invited stakeholders to do that on the 11th of September and the opportunity to do so ran until the 24th of November. 28 responses were received. The responses were broadly in favour eh, of the reforms that we had eh, put in place. Ministers were also required to take account of observations received, publish a statement responding to them and indicate if we intended to uh, make further changes. The Government's statement has been laid in Parliament, it addressed the comments received and set out the modifications uh, we propose to make. The modifications are in the orders that we are discussing today. The the underlying principle uh, behind the September reforms was to put in place an appropriate system of state disclosure and self-disclosure, uh, reflecting on the relevant UK Supreme Court decision in this area. The reform system put in place in September, which meant that individuals should no longer have to self-disclose and the state, Disclosure Scotland, should no longer disclose certain spent convictions remains. The revised orders refine these arrangements uh, but do not make uh, fundamental changes. It might be helpful to briefly remind members that both orders contain two lists of offences. These lists are identical in both orders. Uh, one list is a list of offences which requires always to be disclosed uh, through state disclosure and self-disclosure. Uh, this includes, for example, rape. The second list is a, a list of offences which requires to be disclosed uh, subject to application of certain rules, and this includes, uh, for example, assault. The key changes in the two orders before the committee are uh, a number of offences have been added uh, to the two lists of offences contained in the orders. Some offences have been moved between the lists in the orders and the time allowed to take forward uh, an application to the sheriff for removal of a spent conviction from a disclosure has been reduced from six months to three months. Uh, members will recall that both orders operate in tandem, so it is necessary to amend both earlier orders to ensure uh, that state and self-disclosure uh, continue to be aligned. If Parliament approves the orders, uh, the original remedial order will be replaced in its entirety, uh, though the, the vast majority of content uh, remains the same as before. In addition, the two offence lists in the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974, Exclusions and Exceptions Scotland Order 2013, uh, will have amendments uh, made to them. Uh, convener, I wrote to you on the 24th September, following evidence the committee took from officials about the reforms, uh, I replied on the 6th of December. Uh, I hope that letter satisfactorily uh, answered members' questions. Uh, so once again, I want to put on record my thanks for Parliament's assistance uh, in taking forward uh, these important reforms, uh, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, if members wish to ask questions, uh, please indicate, but I'll, I'll kick off, if you don't mind. We've had a number of submissions, Cabinet Secretary, um, about uh, these orders. But can I begin um, with some questions from uh, the uh, Scottish Council of Jewish Communities? They, as you'll have noticed from their submission, have got a number of areas that they've got some questions and concerns with. Um, the first one was about the, the date from which the notification period should be counted. Um, uh, what they state is that there are, is an inconsistency in the way that this is uh, laid out in the orders. Um, uh, 3 4 116 ZB 3A states that an individual is allowed 10 working days beginning with the date of the issue of the certificate. However, 4 5 52 A 3A states that the relevant period will be 10 working days beginning with the date on which the scheme record was sent to the scheme member. That sounds inconsistent to me. Which, which of those is it? And, or is there a reason why there are two different uh, descriptions of when the 10 working days begins from? Okay. There is a complexity to, to this, so I will ask officials, I will ask Ailsa in particular to be um, clear about that. So the, the, there is different wording. Mm. The 10 days, though, it is counted from the date that the disclosure is issued and sent out to the applicant. And the date of issue and the date of sending out are the same. The date of issue and the date of sending out are always the same, 100% of the time. You yes. can guarantee that no certificate is issued, for example, late on a Friday afternoon, but not posted until the Monday. I would have to ask the, the um, policy. No, it, <coughs> issued means the point at which it leaves Disclosure Scotland. And it is issued and sent are the same thing. We have, of course, no control over how long it takes I'll, I'll, come to to yes, I'll come on to that. Yes, I'll come on to that in a okay. second. So, what you're saying is that these two different—I'm not quite sure why you use two different sets of wording then to mean the same thing. Yeah. The, the, the wording is different simply because the Parent Act, the primary, the primary legislation in the Police Act, and in the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Act, is different. And in that, consistently through the PVG Act, the wording is sent to an applicant, uh, and whereas. In the Police Act, it is consistently their wording is about issue of disclosures. And if we, if we had tried to use the same wording in both acts, then you, you, we run the risk of confusing what is meant in each act with sent, issued. But um, our view is that issued and sent mean the same thing. It is when Disclosure Scotland has exercised its function and issued the disclosure to the person, because until it goes out of the door, Disclosure Scotland, in terms of the Police Act, has not issued a disclosure, because it has not fulfilled its function. So the, the, the 10 day working days begins at the point at which you, it leaves the building. Is that yes. correct? Um, how would the individual who receives this several days later um, know when the clock started ticking? How would, how would they know what the, when the 10 days started? Is, is the day of, it, day of issue, in other words, the day that it leaves the building, is that day one or is it another day? Is it the following day? It leaves the building is day one of the 10 so, days. I mean, in practical terms, if it's posted out in the evening, on a Friday evening, that's day one. Yes. Right. And the individual gets it, say, on the Monday. Yes. And that's day two. Um, that's day two, yes, because right, it's ten okay. working days. Right, and if it's a public if it's a public holiday, they get it on the Tuesday. So is that still day two? That's still day two. Still day two. Get the public How would holiday. they know that they're on day two if they got it on the Tuesday? There is certainly information that is sent to the applicant uh, from Dis Disclosure Scotland. I, mean, I don't have the exact wording in front of me, convener, um, but there are efforts made to inform uh, applicants uh, of their rights and, in particular, uh, of, of their rights uh, to appeal matters to, to a sheriff if they so wish. No, I understand that. What I'm, what I'm asking is, if I am waiting on uh, this coming to me, and it arrives through the post, uh, you know, um, and I go home this evening, it's there. How do I know how long I've got? How much of the 10 days have I got left? The certificate itself will have a date on it, which is the date that the certificate was, that, that the disclosure was um, concluded, if you like, the disclosure process and the, the date that the certificate is printed. Now, that date will always be a date in advance of the day that you receive it, obviously, because there is time 
taken for it to be delivered. But it will give the applicant an indication of when that 10 days started. An applicant could assume that 10 days started the day after the date on the certificate. They, they, so they, they can assume... So I, I, I want to go through this very carefully because obviously people's you know, lives and employment prospects are at stake. If it's printed with a date on it on a Friday, they can assume what? If it's printed with a date on it on a Friday, it would not be posted until the Saturday because it's never, printed on, it's never posted on the same day that it's printed. So it would not be posted until the, until the Saturday. If it was delivered on the Monday, and that's the part that we have no control over, which is why we can't specify exactly when the 10 days starts, but if they received it on the Monday, then they would know that the 10 days hadn't started until the day after the print date. No, you, you, can, you, you can say categorically when the day, 10 days starts. You just did a moment ago. You said the 10 days starts when it leaves the building. But as, a, but as the recipient of that, how do I know how many days I have left? I don't want to make an assumption. I want to know exactly when my 10 days is up. The best way in which for you to be able to know would be to contact Disclosure Scotland and ask us, ask our CLT team specifically, tell me when the 10 days will be up. But I don't, I don't see how we can put that on the certificate because, not, because we wouldn't... I'm asking you, though, as an individual who's sitting in their home and receives one of these certificates, knowing that they have a 10-day working day period to appeal to the sheriff... No, no, a 10-day working notify. day period to notify to Disclosure notify. Scotland. Sorry, slip of, slip of the tongue. To notify, it would be nice to know that I, I, I know for certain when my 10-day period is up. Is that, not, is that not reasonable? It is reasonable, Convener, and uh, Disclosure Scotland, uh, following the uh, action we took in September, uh, certainly updated uh, their uh, website uh, and there is information that goes out uh, with the certificates and there are also dedicated customer service uh, officers uh, as well who you know, answer telephone inquiries and email inquiries uh, where people need you know, uh, f f further uh, clarity. So, uh, when you send it out, does it say, you know, if you want to know when the 10 days is up, contact this number? It says if you intend to... Uh, uh, if you want to notify us of your intent to appeal, you must do that within 10 working days. The date, there will always be a date on the certificate that gives the applicant an indication of when that 10... Yeah, no, you said that before. It doesn't tell them when the 10 days is up, though, does it? It doesn't. No, and I'm asking you whether or not you tell people when, when, that if you want to know when your, the, the 10 days is up, you have to contact us. We don't specify that, you don't specify in, that. in the um, insert. Right. Do you think that's an issue? I think that's an issue. The evidence so far would suggest that it may not be because we, have, we do have people notifying us within 10 working days and people notify us within plenty of time within that 10 working days. But there, there may well be other people who, you know, for whatever reason, haven't come to their certificate early after it's been received and, and may not know that they're still within the 10 working days. Okay. Um... The length of no why did you choose a period of 10 days as a notification period? Um, you, you've, you've, just, you've just stated that, of course, you don't know when, how long it would take for it to arrive at an individual, how long the post takes, depending on bank holidays, Christmas posting, all the rest of it. Why did you choose 10 days? We chose 10 days because we thought that was a reasonable period of time in which to allow people to notify us, given that these certificates are generally being requested for employment purposes and because we are withholding the counter signatories copy of the certificate until that period of time for notification has passed, um, we felt that 10 days was a sufficient period of time in which to withhold that because that holds up the employment decision. What would happen if somebody's on holiday? They would miss the 10 days. They would miss the 10 days? Yes. If they is were is that reasonable? Them. We have to draw a line in the sand. If somebody's away on holidays for a month, does that mean that we allow a month? For... No, I, don't say, I think that's rather facetious as an answer. I mean, I think the, most people go on holiday for a week, 10 days or a fortnight. Um, if you chose 20 days as the period, then you would catch 90% or 99% of the people who even went on holiday during that period. 
I don't know many people who go on a month's holiday, but perhaps you do. But is it reasonable that if somebody's on holiday, they miss the 10 days and they're right to, to indicate that they wish to appeal? We felt that 10 days was a reasonable period of time. That, that wasn't my question. <coughs> I would say it's reasonable. So <laughs> if somebody's on holiday and they come back and they find this and they've missed their 10 days, is, is that it? They've missed, their, they've missed their right to notify they wish to appeal? Yes. So, and, and you think that's reasonable? Yes. You think that's reasonable? Cabinet Secretary, do you think that's reasonable? I think if you're applying for a protected post to you know, certain positions uh, in financial services, uh, a solicitor, accountant, uh, a doctor, a social worker or other posts uh, where you're working with uh, vulnerable children and vulnerable adults, uh, you'll be well aware of the importance uh, of the disclosure process. Um, and you will be you know, alert to uh, any potential issues in, in, in your own background. So, uh, taken in the round, uh, I do think it's reasonable. Yeah, well, I, I don't. I mean, I think if somebody, somebody's got a holiday booked and then a, a job's advertised and they apply for that job and they have to go through this process, the fact that they happen to be on holiday should not be a, a reason why they're then uh, disadvantaged. But they will know if there's something in their background that is likely to be disclosed. I mean, you know if you've got a, a previous conviction or not, don't you? You do. But you don't know that a job's about to be advertised that you wish to apply for when you've got a holiday family holiday book, do you? Well, I mean, you apply for a job, you get an application form, and that in itself kicks off um, you know, a process. So when you apply for the job, you will be aware uh, of the obligations uh, in terms of you know, uh, uh, high, high level disclosures. No, I understand that. What, what I'm not understanding is uh, why, if I, have a if I have a family holiday booked, and then in advance of that family holiday, a job comes up that uh, I wish to apply for, knowing my background, um, in this case, as mm -hmm. an example, um, why the being on family holidays should uh, uh, disadvantage me in the application process. But then if you were concerned that you were uh, going to be out the country, for example, um, and I accept that people do indeed uh, go on holiday, it's not, it's not unreasonable, but if, if you know you're going to be out the country when correspondence is likely to come uh, for disclosure, from Disclosure Scotland, I mean, people make you know, all sorts of arrangements you know, prior to going on holiday um, if they're expecting you know, import, important posts. So you know, it would be open for people to uh, discuss their concerns with Disclosure Scotland so if I was prior going to on, going on holiday. If, if I was going on holiday in such an eventuality, um, could I notify you in advance of receiving your, your correspondence that I would wish to perhaps put in such an appeal? You could notify us. A better course of action, though, would be to discuss that with the person who is countersigning the application form and speak to them about the correct point or the most desirable point in, at which to submit the application. You have to fill the application form in first, and it has to go to the employer. Mm -hmm. The employer has to consider that, whether they're going to employ or not. Now, what, what period of time that may take, how many applications a person's got, and then the registered person has to make a decision whether they actually want to actually undertake that because there may be an interview process. Yeah. So it may take longer than two weeks from the point the person sees the job to actually doing that. So what, at what point? So it, I think the key thing there is actually to talk to the employer and say, I'm taking a holiday. I've applied for this job. Is there any flexibility around when you're likely to interview me? It's not just about disclosure. Scott. It's about the relationship with the person who's going for a, a job, applying for the job and going on holiday to have that discussion with the employer. Surely that's important as well. It's all important. I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that uh, individuals are not disadvantaged unfairly. Um, that's why I'm asking the question. Uh, Chick, did you have a... Sorry, did you indicate you wanted a question? No, I, I want to ask a question about the, the list of offences. And, and a separate issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you confirm, um, Cabinet Secretary, um, why there is... Um, does not seem to be a process to allow an individual to indicate that they have changed their mind after they've indicated they wish to appeal, uh, or they, they may wish to appeal to a sheriff uh, within the 10 days, and they decided then after that period that they decided they will not appeal. Mm. Okay, I'm going to ask Diane to answer that. Within the, if, if, a, if an applicant notifies us within the 10 working days that they intend to submit an application to a sheriff, they receive 
an acknowledgement email from Disclosure Scotland which sets out the steps that they need to go through and the implications of those steps, which reiterates the information that they have already been sent. Um, but the person can then notify us within the 10 working days that they want to withdraw their intention, to, the notification of the intention to appeal. If they do that within the 10 working days, we will withdraw that notification and the counter-signatory copy will be sent out. If they don't do that within the 10 working days, then it's correct that there is no provision for the applicant to withdraw their notification of intention to appeal. And the purpose of that was because we, we didn't feel that we could cater for every possible eventuality of people changing their minds and the point at which people might change their minds. So, you know, somebody could say, I'm going to... Um, uh, I intend to apply to a sheriff and we wouldn't send out the counter-signatory copy if they then came back to us three months later or four months later and said, I've changed my mind. We would then be required to send out the counter-signatory's copy, uh, potentially to, to no purpose. Yes, but if, you, if an individual has applied, said, notified that they intend to appeal within the 10 working days and then they change their mind... Let's say within. Let's first of all take the case where they, they, they decide to inform you within, rather they change their mind within the ten working days. Do they have to inform you that they've changed their mind? Yes, yes they have to inform inform us in order to authorise us to send out the counter signatory copy of the certificate. How would you know if they had decided to not city to appeal? If you, if, they, if you just re received nothing back, would you just sit for the three months then and wait? We no. wouldn't. Sorry? We wouldn't know. If they didn't notify you us that know. they had decided not to, we wouldn't no. know. So why have you not put in place um, a provision which uh, tells people they must inform you that they've, they're withdrawing? We didn't feel that that would be an approach that we could enforce. Section 33 of the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 makes it an offence for individuals not to notify Disclosure Scotland of certain changes in circumstances. Wouldn't the same sort of rule have fitted here? That, I, don't, I don't think we could have uh, created a new criminal offence. Uh, Sorry, I, I, I've just read out to you that Section 33 of the Protection of Vulnerable Groups makes it an offence for individuals not to notify Disclosure Scotland of changes in circumstance. Why could you not have done the same thing here? Uh, section 33 applies only in relation to um, uh, the circumstances listed and any other circumstances that we have prescribed. Um, but uh, that is in relation to a process when ministers are considering to list someone. Section 33 doesn't apply to, the, to, the, to part two of the Act which is about the disclosure process. It was a general point, not about the specific. I mean, given the fact that there is a, a, an offence for individuals not to notify Disclosure Scotland of certain changes. Yes, but we couldn't have created a new criminal offence in, 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 in the context of the remedial order. No, I know that. Not in terms of putting it through in terms of through the remedial order. I understand that. Yes. I'm asking why it wasn't done, no, in general. Why, why would you not... Um, uh, uh, put this in place to ensure that individuals had to inform you of this change in circumstance, given you've done it elsewhere? Well, this was done in primary legislation, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the requirement, the, the offence provision. No, I understand that. I'm, I'm asking a general question about why it wasn't done in this circumstance. We had no powers to do it in this circumstance. To require, to require, to Sorry, make no, a criminal offence. Sorry, no, you're obviously misunderstanding me. I mean, given the fact that you have done it before, using primary legislation... I accept. Yeah. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that you could do it through the secondary legislation that we're discussing here today. But what I'm asking you is, why, in one set of circumstances, would you create an offence for individuals not to notify the Disclosure Scotland of changes in circumstances, but not do it in this case? I think that the, 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 that the requirement in Section 33 is quite different in that the person is under... A, in, 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 it being considered for listing, it's therefore important that Disclosure Scotland, as it considers the person for listing, is, a, is aware of changes in address. In my recollection is we haven't prescribed any other circumstances in which they have to uh, notify us. But you accept you could have done? I'm not quite sure. I don't see how we... We could have made it... A, uh, we could have 
perhaps made a requirement that somebody notifies us, but it, was, it would have been unenforceable then. And, um, because there's, we can't make it a criminal offence so in un, this context. Is, 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 is Section 33 unenforceable? No, no, it's not. Section 33 is not unenforceable, but it applies in a completely different context. I'm not sure what the context has to do with it, frankly. But, you know, if, that's, if I'm not going to get anywhere with that, I'll move on to what was my final question. Um, the job description in terms of what has to be put on the application form for a scheme record, um, you have to put your job title down. That's correct, isn't it? Yes. And uh, the job title has, as I understand it on the form, um, uh, a, a box or a set of boxes, 64 characters long. If somebody puts down um, a particular job as youth football coach, how does that, um, in what way does that allow the sheriff to decide uh, whether or not a previous conviction should be uh, disclosed or not it's disclosed? Or, in fact, Disclosure Scotland decide? How, how would you decide if it says youth football coach? With regard to how Disclosure Scotland would decide, we, we have no discretion over what's disclosed in terms of what's in the list. So the fact that somebody has put youth football coach makes no difference to the offences that are on either Schedule 8A to always be disclosed or 8B uh, to be disclosed subject to rules or not on either of those lists because we determined in the legislation that the offences on those lists are relevant to all types of roles for which a higher level disclosure is required. So if somebody had um, previous uh, road traffic convictions which are uh, under Section 103 of Schedule 8B, um, they, how would you know whether or not they should be allowed to not have those disclosed if the job is youth football coach? Well, if they're on Schedule 8B, mm -hmm. then the rules within the order determine that they should be disclosed because they ought to be of relevance to the consideration of employment. For a, for a role that requires a higher level disclosure. Sorry, if, if the person is applying for that job and the job does not involve any driving, but it's youth football coach, and another job is youth football coach but, also, but does involve driving, how would, how would you know? Because when you join up the list of offences, consideration uh, was given in terms of not... not um, you know, that, that there isn't a correlation between different types of jobs and what may or may not be disclosed when. You know, the issue is, you know, whether there has been, whether a crime is in relation to dishonesty, whether a person's been in a position of trust, uh, reckless behaviour. Um, in the policy document, it, it details um, principles uh, that have informed um, the the, 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 the two lists. So in devising the two lists, uh, the policy note uh, talks about you know, where people are going into positions of trust, uh, positions of authority, um, where um, you know, we would be interested in offences that you know, relate to uh, recklessness or, 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 or serious harm. If someone dis is in dispute with that, if an individual feels that a previous uh, offence that is currently listed uh, in 8B, they can then take that to the sheriff. And of course, you know, the sheriff will draw on all the resources that sheriffs do in deciding what's reasonable and uh, how to apply the law. And you know, case law will, be, will come forthwith. Cameron Secretary, that's what I'm asking. <clears throat> um, what information beyond the job description would be available then? If it's, if it's regulated work with children and it falls under the Rehabilitation Offenders Act Exclusion Exceptions or just Schedule 4, then a high level disclosure will be required. In the past, all spent convictions would be disclosed because it's regulated work with children, and therefore you need a PVG check. Now, Schedule A, A, B or A1 will always be disclosed. However, the B1 or AB is the one subject to rules. So if it's under 15 years and you had the conviction when you were over 18, then it will be disclosed if it's on those rules lists. If it was admonished, it wouldn't be. If it was an absolute discharge, it wouldn't be one spent. However, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, 
the person has got an opportunity to say, well, that thing that I had is not relevant to this specific thing, even though the rule says that it has to be disclosed because it's part of the rules, and the exceptions order says the job I'm doing is regulated work, the sheriff can consider the circumstances of that person and say, well, we don't want to disclose it, and then it won't be disclosed. Right. right. So the relevant, the relevancy is the question here. So in terms of the individual making the application, the relevance is whether it's a, a job that's excluded from the protections under the Rehabilitation Offenders Act by the Rehabilitation Offenders Act Exclusion and Exception Scotland Order. And the key thing that kicks into PVG is Schedule 4, which talks about either regulated work with children or regulated work with adults. And if the employment falls under those, then high level disclosures are required. There's other, obviously, employment where you have a standard enhanced disclosure or not rather than a PV disclosure. So it's the exclusion of the exceptions order that disapplies the protections that allows disclosure of spent convictions to be allowed. So in the example I gave of somebody putting down youth football coach, it doesn't involve driving, but they've got a previous road traffic offence. Could they apply to, to, to have that effectively that not disclosed? Well, depending on the circumstances of what the offence was and what the driving offence was, if the driving offence was so serious it was over two and a half years, it will never be spent, so it will always be disclosed. Yeah. If it is offence that's in the rules list but it's under 15 years, then it would be disclosed, but the person has a right to appeal it. Yeah. If they were under 18 at the time, it would be six, seven and a half years. If they were admonished for the thing that they did, then it wouldn't be disclosed once spent. If they had an absolute discharge, it wouldn't be, spent, wouldn't be disclosed once spent. Okay, so but so, my, so my, my it depends on what that is. Does that specific job title fall under the PVG rules as a result of regulated work with children? If it does, then higher level disclosure is required. Mm. The person has obviously got the right. If it's not, if it's on the rules list, to appeal it to the sheriff, they and can the sheriff appeal, can make that decision. That was my question. So yeah. they can they can appeal it. Yes, in, in the circumstances. In the circumstances. Right. So remove it. Following on from that, therefore, um, given that the, the Schools of Scotland can determine whether a subsequent scheme record application has been made, and I'm going to just quote, made for the same purpose for which the application for the other certificate was made, in other words, another youth football coach in another, for another employer, how would you know that it was, the job description effectively was the same in both cases? In, the, in relation to the, um, the, the applications for the scheme record, uh, it's in relation to the type of regulated work, not the, not the purpose of each individual disclosure for it. It's, it's for the type of regulated work that the, the appeal provisions operate in relation to, for PVG. The Police Act provisions are slightly different. Yeah, so I just want clarity on this. So, I mean, if, if an individual applies and under the previous circumstances, they appeal because of a road traffic act uh, violation and therefore that uh, conviction, sorry, uh, that is agreed. They don't have to disclose that particular one. Then they apply, apply for another job, a different job, which has got exactly the same job title. Um, and does Disclosure Scotland can effectively rule that it's made for the same purpose. How would, you, how would Disclosure Scotland know that the second job had a different job description in, involving other activities, for example, driving the children round that the first one didn't have? So what you're saying, convener, if, an if a sheriff has ruled that an offence is not disclosable in the first, in in the first mm -hmm. set of circumstances, you know, does that apply forever? Does that then mean the disclosure well, not, not forever, can never? But, not forever, but I mean, if somebody applies for the, for for the same, a, a, a same job, the same job title, but it just happens to be that in the second job, but, but driving the, is part of the job. Yeah, but I mean, I, mean, I think the, the same job title is um, a bit misleading because, as, as Nigel says, it's, it's not so much the job title, it's whether the job is regulated and, and protected. So, no. um, I'm asking how you would know. How would Disclosure Scotland know? Disclosure Scotland doesn't know the, the details of each individual job that the person is applying for. They, they're looking to see whether the job falls within the, the, the scope of regulated work. And a football coach, a youth a football coach would. And in relation to the appeal provisions, if somebody had appealed against the disclosure and the driving conviction was removed from the disclosure in the appeal, from their P that would be removed from their PVG scheme record in relation to the type of regulated work that they had applied for. So if it was regulated work with children, their scheme record in relation to regulated work with children will have that driving conviction removed. Irrespective of what subsequent job it would always be removed. It would always be removed because it relates to the type of regulated work. 
I mean, and that is why the, the list of offences covers various types of offences because it applies across the ambit of regulated work. So, yeah. so it would always be removed irrespective of the, the fact that the first job there was no driving involved, no driving children around, but the second job did involve driving children around. Well, to only consider convictions for insurance, driving convictions until they're spent, so for five years. So if you get fined and endorsed, that will be spent within five years. They don't, insurance companies don't. So in terms of if you're looking for, is it right that someone who's driving a job, well, insurance companies obviously think that sorry, once no, a conviction is spent, I think that's that irrelevant. it's okay not sorry, to sorry, no, no, I'm, I'm, no, I want to go back to my question, which has nothing to do with insurance companies, but it's to do with the fact that if, if it is ruled that that, that conviction does not have to be disclosed. I'm asking you, and I asked the question, would it be permanently that would be the situation? The answer was yes. So I'm asking you whether or not you think it's reasonable that in the first job application, which was uh, doing the job, but no driving was involved, no driving of vulnerable groups or children or anybody else, but in the second job, driving was involved. And I, 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 if I'm correct in the interpretation of what was, the reply was, there's the, the disclosure on the, driving, the previous driving conviction would not be disclosed in either circumstances. It couldn't be disclosed because the sheriff has ordered it. It's removed from the person's scheme record in relation to regulated work with children. The sheriff, in making that decision to remove the, the driving conviction from the record, has to be satisfied that the driving conviction would not be relevant, not to the job that the person applied for, at that time, but to the type of regulated work in which right. they participate in the scheme. Okay. So it's a matter for the sheriff to consider when he is, or he, she is looking at actually removing something from someone's record, that if someone is at the moment not doing a job that involves driving, but you know, at some point in the future could be doing regulated work with children that in involves driving, then the sheriff has to take that into account in making a decision. So the sheriff and all will take all possible future circumstances? would have to, because the decision. sheriff is That's required to remove the conviction from the, the scheme record. So the sheriff is then aware that the, that, the, that, that conviction is being removed for all time coming from the record. Thank so, you. You know, no, the test is higher than it's just than just simply the job in question. That's, that's helpful. Thank you for that. Um, Chair. Yes. Good morning. Uh, I wonder if, if I may ask a couple of questions about the list of offences. Uh, I'm somewhat surprised that, that, in looking at the list that's being added to Schedule 8A, that these weren't included uh, in in. in Order one, I mean, aiding, abetting, counselling, procuring or inciting murder, attempting or conspiring to commit murder, assault to danger of life. Why weren't these, what, what criteria uh, were used when you were looking at the list in the preparation of order one? Preparation of order one, Mr Brodie, there was a, a broad range of information uh, that we looked at. We looked at the... Um, you know, the Scottish Government publishes, you know, classifications of crimes and, and statistics. We looked at all that. Um, we looked at the um, uh, criminal history system. We looked at the police national computer. We looked at um, offences listed in the um, Disclosure and Barren Service in England and um, offences that are listed uh, in nor Northern Ireland. And this was, you know, debated, you know, on the floor of the chamber. Uh, we were very clear that um, there would be, you know, post-legislative scrutiny to ensure that the detail on both lists, the, you know, list of offences always to be disclosed and the list of offences to be disclosed subject uh, to rules, that that would have to be, you know, uh, 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 you know subject to further scrutiny and also uh, subject to further uh, quality uh, assurance. And in terms of some of the offences that uh, you mentioned in particular, um, you know, aiding, abetting, counselling, um, you know, procuring, you know, inciting, you know, um, known as, you know, aggravations, you know, to serious offences. Uh, similarly with, uh, you know, danger um, of life. I mean, these are um, aggravation to serious offences. What we wanted to do was to put beyond any doubt um, that these offences should always be disclosed because while um, it is likely that the um, 
conviction that, that the punishment would always mean that these offences you know, would be uh, disclosed forever and that they would never be spent. Uh, we did, after you know, further reflection, scrutiny, quality insurance, want to um, put that uh, beyond absolute doubt. Uh, so that, that we have added to uh, Schedule 8A, um, A1 you know, as, as, as a result um, of that. And it just removes the risk of you know, a lesser sentence, meaning uh, that some offences may not always be disclosed. So it was a, a lengthy detailed process prior to Order 1. We have taken the opportunity to you know, go, go through the process again, each individual offence again, um, you know, have obviously benefited from the consultation period and feedback from uh, the faculty um, of, of, of advocates as, as well. And it is, you know, important that, you know, the, the offences that have been added, uh, you know, there, they, there haven't been any... Um, requests, bar on one occasion, there have been no requests for higher level disclosures and all the offences uh, that have been asked you know, in the latter part um, of last year, bar one, where the conviction uh, you know, would always be disclosed because of the, the, the sentence that, 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 was, that was given. That's a very, thank you for that very comprehensive answer. I just wonder, then, in looking at Schedule 8B, that in the current environment particularly, um, the, the, and, uh, the offences to be added under that schedule is, first of all, uh, those offences that are racially aggravated and those that are ag aggravated by religious prejudice. Why are these in Schedule 8B and not in Schedule 8A, given the, the, the landscape that we currently have? Yeah, and um, one of the things that we did do uh, in the 60-day post-making uh, consultation period was that we wanted to um, give further uh, consideration to the, the, the Equality Act. Um, the aggravations uh, that Mr Brodie mentioned have been added uh, to uh, Schedule B, I suppose in the same way the aggravations involving children um, or sexual motivations have been added to uh, shed Schedule A. Um, you know, th these are um, all serious um, ag aggravations and it is important to remember that in terms of Schedule 8B, B1, that for an offence committed by someone over 18, I mean, we're talking about a disclosure, uh, you know, 15 years, it will be 15 years um, before uh, this, an offence listed on 8B, B1 um, is considered to be spent. So that's, you know, it is a lengthy period of time. Uh, and that leads me to another question. Why is it reasonable? Can you perhaps explain uh, why is it reasonable to bind up the consideration of age of the person with the time elapsed since the conviction? I mean, I, again, in the current demography, I don't understand why that particular, you know, given the 1974 Act, why that consideration is currently reasonable. It, it was certainly one of the factors raised in the original uh, UK Supreme Court case. Um, that court case, as we know, led to um, us having to refine um, our disclosure uh, procedures uh, in a way that uh, was more uh, proportionate. Um, and age is currently a factor in the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, which goes back to 1974, but in the actual judgment uh, from the UK Supreme Court where they accepted that having a system of higher level disclosures was indeed appropriate and that there should be offences that are never, uh, you know, they may be spent in some contexts, but in other contexts, you know, they can't be spent. Uh, and, it, you know, pointed to certain factors uh, that um, contributed to a fairer, reasonable, more proportionate system, and age uh, was, was certainly one of them. Okay, thank you. One last question, if I may. Uh, the elephant in the room, of course, is ORI. I mean, mm -hmm. in terms of the information which Police Scotland may submit, uh, what recourse would an ind individual have to in knowing about that what in other relevant information has been provided to yeah, mitigate against, uh, against uh, the spent conviction not being disclosed? 
The police have always had the authority over and above uh, the high-level disclosure system to disclose anything uh, that's that they have information about that is considered proportionate and reasonable and relevant uh, to, to the release. Well, I mean, that is the, well, that's the chief, the, um, the senior police officers. They obviously have to do that um, in cognizance of ECHR, uh, and of course, you know, people do, you know, ultimately have recourse uh, to the courts if they wish to challenge that. Okay, thank you. Can I just check that? I mean, are you confident this is ECHR compliant, the OR, ORI stuff? It's not, been, it's, not, it's not been challenged. It wasn't, you know, subject to the, the, the UK Supreme Court uh, case. Um, mm -hmm. People, you know, as they uh, currently do, have the, the right to challenge many aspects uh, of our criminal justice system and our public protection system um, on, on an ECHR uh, basis. Um, and in terms of the order in front of us today, um, the, what, what, what's been clarified, if you like, is that the, if people review that, you know, because people can ask the, the police to review that decision, that in the process of the review, we've clarified that the police have to apply the same test that they have to apply uh, in the first place. So the orders in front of us um, aren't dealing with, you know, the principle of the police being able to release you know, other relevant information, um, we are you know, clarifying that if an individual uh, wishes a review, that the, same, the police have to apply the same test that already exists. Yep. It's really the context I'm thinking of. Mm. Effectively, we're, we're here today. I mean, this, this, is, this reform is in the context of responses to ECHR concerns. I, mean, that's, I think that's a fair description of why we're here. Um, given that, and I know you've tightened how this is done in terms of uh, how the police operate here or the way that they can operate in releasing information, but it does seem, certainly at least to a layman, slightly odd that um, the police could still, ha still have the authority or still have the right to provide information about spent convictions or even stuff which is not even a spent convictions over and above what is uh, disclosed through the certificates given the context of the ECHR reasons why we're here today. Yeah, and it has to be proportionate. Uh, and, you know, we have to get the right balance uh, between being reasonable, proportionate, um, and using information that's relevant. And that has to be balanced uh, with public safety. Okay. George, did you have a question? Yes. Actually, sorry to go back a bit. It was just in the back of some of the conveners' earlier questions with regards to uh, someone applying for a position and uh, one of the examples, I'd the one time myself that I actually had to have an enhanced disclosure uh, it came back and the individual said, oh Mr Adam, you didn't disclose, you've appeared at Dingwall Sheriff Court now it's not quite as exciting as what you all think it is at the moment, I hadn't paid the Sky Bridge toll, but I managed to tell him that and uh, the individual then said, well, that's okay then. Now, in some of these inst things that are already on your disclosure, would that not be the kind of conversations that would be had when someone's actually applying with a job at that stage, you know, or, or applying for a position, whether it be a youth coach or whatever, whether it be a road traffic offence? You know, with some of these minor offences, would that not be the kind of conversations that would be had? I mean, ultimately, um, the matters you describe are ones for employers. I mean, what the government uh, has to do, and in accordance with the uh, UK uh, Supreme Court ruling, is we have to establish a system of rules that apply to what is disclosed uh, when and under what circumstances. And when employers get that information, uh, you know, it will be employers that make judgments uh, about that individual's uh, fitness to, to, to work. Personally, I just frames mine and put it up in my office right enough, you know. Uh, Mary Scanlon. It's a point of clarity, convener. Can I apologise for being late? I did uh, mention it to you last week, but I've been at the Health Committee putting forward nine amendments on the Health Bill in terms of uh, willful neglect, uh, ill treatment and abuse. So when I came here and heard Chick Brodie's question, so can I apologise, convener, if this has already been answered um, uh, to the rest of the committee? <clears throat> it's the offences to be moved from uh, Schedule A, B to A, 
8A uh, on ill treatment and willful neglect. And uh, I really just uh, seek a, a piece of clarity um, here, uh, uh, convener. I, want, I wonder what is the consequence of moving this offence and uh, uh, having, you know, does moving it to 8A strengthen this offence? And uh, I just wondered, given that the Health uh, Committee are putting through a bill particularly on ill treatment and uh, uh, willful neglect, um, if there's any further tie-in uh, with the sub that's going through today with the Stage 2 bill that Maureen Watt is in charge of. So, really, I'm just asking, uh, because I presume that what's happening today under this subordinate legislation, I'm presuming that the movement of ill treatment and willful neglect will strengthen it in some way, but I'm really just seeking a bit of clarity around these issues, given that I've been looking at them for the last couple of days. Yes, I mean, the short answer is that it will yes. strengthen the position and we needed to make compatible um, the mental health uh, legislation and the adults with incapacity yeah. legislation. So that's why there's been that movement upwards, if you like. Could I just, sorry, yeah. could I just add to that? We are aware of the new offences that are proposed within the health bill and it is our intention to seek to add those to one of the schedules in due course, but we can't add them in at this point because I they're not yet enacted. That. But you are, it, it will be added here. It's our intention to add yeah. them in Thank due you, course. Thank you, Convener. Yes, um, just uh, two quick, hopefully, clarifications. Uh, I presume that you know, in future, any new offences that are created will be uh, just will create new orders and effectively you will just add them in the normal process. That would be the standard way you'll do that, yeah? Yes, um, and uh, Disclosure Scotland will also undertake um, a review, you know, a, a formal review in three years' time, which will allow it to look at any case law that's been established in the event of appeals as well. Okay, and I, I just want to, just for absolute clarity, it was really in relation to the, the questions the questions from uh, Chick. Um, you talked in your answer about the serious offences that uh, have been, are being added to Order 2, um, and also the ones that are being changed from 8B to 8A effectively, but you, you talk mostly about um, the aggravations, the stuff that's been effectively been added because of aggravating factors. Mm -hmm. But can I just check, because um, some of them are not aggravations, I mean, they're mm -hmm. effectively you know, offences which are just being added straight into 8A, mm -hmm. assault to danger of life, for example. Now, can you just explain why, why were these offences not in the original order, Eight, uh, sorry, the ones that, uh, um, not the aggravations, the actual uh, new series of offences that have been added to 8A. Why were they not in the Order 1? Well, I, mean, I certainly uh, hope to cover that uh, comprehensively in my, my answer to Mr Brodie. There were some um, intricacies um, around, um, you know, some offences, you know, like, you know, murder, you know, can never be spent. Um, so therefore we wanted to look you know, very you know, carefully at you know, offences, you know, aid and abet in counsel and procuring or, or inciting um, to, to, to murder. So you know, we needed to um, you know, make sure that we were capturing um, everything. And we were very clear uh, when I went to, to Parliament that while we had done our, our best to ensure that everything was in the right list, um, I mean, we certainly weren't um, arrogantly you know, suggesting that there wasn't a need for further scrutiny uh, or indeed, you know, the, the expert views of people like from the, the, the faculty of, of, of advocates. I don't know if officials want to add anything to that. Specifically in relation to the assault uh, to danger of life, we had looked at the offences that have been disclosed on higher level disclosure since 2011 and that as a kind of freestanding offence, if you like, had not arisen. What we had found was that um, offences of assault, very serious assault, are almost always charged as assault to severe injury and danger of life. And that was specified very much within Schedule 8A and will uh, always be disclosed. Uh, it was the Faculty of Advocates who came to us and said, well, actually, it's not unheard of. It's, not, it's not, certainly not common, but it's not unheard of for an offence of assault to danger of life to be charged just as, a, as that you know, with, with the danger of life aggravator as the only part of it. And we felt that for 
really for the purposes of clarity and to make sure that we would always capture it in the event that it ever received a sentence that could become spent, that we would add it into the list. Were they just missed? Is that what you're saying? The, no, that, that particular one on the assault to danger of life is not one that we had come across in terms of being an offence that was charged as a freestanding offence. It, it was always included in the assault yeah. to severe injury. But you seem to be suggesting what you did was you went back and looked at the ones that had come up in terms of disclosure. And that's, that's how you created the first list. Is that, is that right? That was one of the considerations. <laughs> we, we also you know, we, we looked at the um, CHS list of every offence uh, so, charge code that C exists in CHS Scotland. Is Sorry, the criminal history system. Criminal history system. Um, there's, a, there's a very extensive list of 8,000, in excess of 8,000 charge codes um, for offences in Scotland, and we went through that and looked at every single offence code. And these weren't on it? There's, the assault to danger of life was on it, but it wasn't anything that we have ever disclosed in since 2011, since um, PVG came into effect. Okay. Because, but, but we have disclosed lots of assault to severe injury and danger of life. Okay. Um, given that, are we confident now that we have captured everything that needs to be captured on these lists? There's been very extensive work undertaken, uh, you know, in, in bringing together the original order. Um, that has been, you know, added to with, you know, even more detailed work in advance of this uh, order because it's been subject to, or it's been informed uh, by uh, co consultation. So I, I think we are as confident as we can reasonably, reasonably be. Okay, thank you. Just one final question. Is, is there any chance that any of the, the uh, offences which have been added to or being moved um, in this order that there are some people who effectively, between Order 1 and Order 2, um, would have been effectively guilty of any of these particular offences, and it's been treated differently because they were uh, in the gap between Order 1 and Order 2. Um, I mean, I'll ask officials to confirm, but um, in terms of the briefings I've received, we've uh, went back, uh, checked the disclosures that have been made, you know, between September and now, and, um, you know, there, there should be no one affected. But I'll ask officials to confirm no, that. that that's, that's correct. We have um, looked at the data in terms of every offence that we're proposing to add or move. We looked at whether there had been any incidents between the 10th of September and the 30th of November of an applicant for a higher level disclosure having one of those convictions on their record. Um, there was one um, attempted murder that had been on an applicant's record that had been disclosed anyway because the sentence meant it would never be spent. So we are expecting the impact of this to be virtually non-existent. We haven't found any evidence of, of people who would be treated differently because we're moving offences between lists. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. And just, sorry, just one final question I should have asked earlier. The, the uh, Business and Regulatory Impact Assessment estimated there would be 50 of these cases in 12 months. There was 27 in the first three months. Are you saying you're still confident it's 50 or 27 would suggest 100? Is, is, sorry, is, is the figure of 50, are you referring to appeals or applications to sheriff? What's, what does the figure of 50 relate to? Um, uh, you, sorry, appeals, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> There's a, a distinct difference between those two figures. We have estimated on the basis of the available information that we might expect to have 50 applications to a sheriff proceeding in the course of a year. Yeah. The figure of 27 uh, is the number of, or was the number of notifications of intention to appeal that we have received. Mm -hmm. the, the current figure is um, actually 65. And of those 65, 19 have subsequently been withdrawn. So we have 41 um, extant notifications. However, none of those notifications have yet, to the best of our knowledge, transferred into an actual application to a sheriff. So that estimate of 50 appeals over the year is, is you know, we're not expecting that to be exceeded because we haven't yet had any actual applications to a sheriff. Okay, thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Thank you. Um, as indicated earlier, we now move to the formal debate on the Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 Remedial No. 2, Order 2015, SSI 2015-423, which is item 3. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion? 
Um, I've nothing further to add um, that's not been already raised in debate and my original opening statement, so I move the order in my name. Yeah, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I put the question there for, sorry, any, any members want to say anything? No, uh, therefore, I put the question that motion S4M 15403 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the formal debate on the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974, Exclusions and Exceptions, Scotland Amendment Order 2016 Draft, which is item 4. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion? I move the motion in my name, Convener. Thank you. Uh, any contributions from members? There are none. I will put the question that motion S4M 15306 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, therefore, uh, just before I uh, close the meeting, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, and her officials for our attendance? Um, and can I also just, um, uh, for the benefit of the committee, uh, just mention that uh, James Brown, who has been with us for the uh, just a short while. Um, this is his final meeting with us before he moves on to, I'm sure, better things in, other, in another part of the Parliament. So can we all wish James uh, all the best and thank him for all his work in supporting the committee over the last few months. Thank you, James. Uh, and with that, um, I close the meeting.